was on the cover of Life Magazine in 1960 for doing something that no one has ever done before. Or he basically, basically um, took a hot air balloon. Well, he right. took a hot air balloon and went through another space. He took it up 19 in one hell um, until he saw this, like nothing's blackness about him, no more sky. And then, and then he did this. He jumped out from the hot air balloon. Um, and what's really interesting about this, about this, his experience of it all, this is him sort of you know, suspended above the earth in lower orbit. And this is him falling. And this is him when he got back to Earth. I was actually really grateful to be back. <laughs> Interesting is like the like, assumption of what would happen, like what he expected to happen, but he didn't happen. In fact, he said when he jumped out of the hair, nothing happened. I felt that ripple of the suits, no air rushing by. He believed he had actually gone too far um, beyond, beyond Earth's gravitational ball was suspended in orbit. He thought he was a tune, but he was actually falling at 600 miles per hour, he just didn't know it because the air pressure was so low. And, and effectively, he was like in this strange environment that he um, no longer recognized. And I just, I find this like, I find this not necessarily creative, which is super interesting that, you know, he's still on Earth. He's still, on Earth. He's still inhabiting the world we have now that we experience in this really strange way. And so to me, that's like, to me, that's like, let me go back real quick. I mean, something else, something that's pretty interesting about it is that why he didn't in the first place. Um, the write-up, he was made as our Navy pilot, and the write-up it was an experiment intended to test the dangers and high altitude failout. So you know, they had all the technology and engineering to predict what would happen, but in some ways they had to literally send someone there to do it and see what would happen. And they had no way of predicting this experience that would be. And so it's kind of so an idea about a material embodiment um, that we look for in our work. And this is something that really influenced me as a student. It's a film by Charles Ray Lynch called The Powers of Ten. And it's a film dealing with the relative size of things in the universe and the effect of changing scale and zooming. So speaking of looking at things in new ways, you know, zooming in and out is amazing other technique for looking at things in different ways. Like very familiar things, um, but from a different perspective. And so these are film stills from the movie stills. And it begins with a guy having a picnic in a park in Chicago and zooms in in sort of molecular structure of less of tissue and then zooms out to the scale of you know, like a galaxy. And what's really interesting to me is that as you scale out, right, so you start to, you know, you see streets, lines, but as you get out, you start to move back, you know, like you see straight lines, you start to see the matter organizing out of center, a different shape to the world at a different scale. And so these curves, you know, like, we look to basically change straight lines to curves as a way of testing them and a way of suggesting different scales. So this is actually um, two of my favorite students, Julia and Dean, actually helped me with the project. And this was like a drawing machine we made. And we just took um, pieces of wood you know, rods and we joined them at the, at the corners and made a frame. And then we looked to like deform that frame as much as we could and we traced it. And so we basically pushed it and bent it and traced it until it broke. And so we got this like series of deformed frames. Um, and, and we were just thinking like, you know, what what, what good does this do us really? Um, but also like like what can we do with it, right? So it's just kind of like a curious investigation. It's really a structure model, a structural model. And so we thought, well, you know, structure ordinarily doesn't really want to bend or deform, it wants to remain rigid and these forced. But we thought, well, what if we just like thinned it out enough? So that was thin enough to really register the forces acting on it. So we could actually see those things happening. And then we looked at how we could stack up those blocks. Um, and it was kind of tricky. You can see these that are like 90 degree cubes that come together in a repetitive way. But here, this become like, you know, really, in some ways, not standard. And so we had to troubleshoot that. And so we came up with this design for these, you know, custom connector pieces that we 3D printed. And we basically model, and through trial and error and observation, we measure sort of averages for how these sticks would come together. So as we met many of them, we started to extract like observations from them and design for that. Um, and you know what's interesting about structure is that Pierre Luigi Nervi, the Italian engineer, said, you know, the paradox of structure is that you need to put it wherever the force needs to run, but at the same time, the force will run wherever you put the structure. So we titled this project Force Frames, and these are some photos of those connectors 
that we plug together. So you can see, like, they're fairly rigid, but they're also thin enough that they could be flexed. So just by plugging them in to these connectors, we were able to start to deform and distort the frame. And here you can see us, like, assembling them in these galleries, stacking them up. And so we got these, like, really big walls, and it was, you know, kind of a pavilion. It was, like, an environment that you could walk through. Um, but it was really like a structural model, and, and we, we encouraged people to tap on it and it kind of shimmered and shimmied with you, and it was interactive. It moved, and that was the point. It wasn't static. So you can see some of those bends along the frame. And so these are these 14 foot tall walls that lasted for a little while. So this was like, you know, we drew this thing, you know, we constructed two big walls and could stand between in the gallery. And it's really like an exhibition of drawing. I mean, um, there's drawings of the wall of this, but then you know the actual construction is a lot like a three-dimensional drawing in this other. And so it, they were, it was kind of hard to appreciate those connectors there. So we actually scaled them up so that you could kind of like appreciate them more. So we scaled them up to the scale of a stool, and we 3D printed these things larger, and we made like a series of. Um, I made some schools, I need to stop here. And so these are all based on like that initial test with our hands like when we would. We scaled up that deformation, which really becomes representational at that point. But just to give you an idea, this is a full scale drawing, a 14 foot tall drawing that we put on the wall. So we had like a full scale representation of something that was right next to it. Um, and we're interested in this idea of scale and how it can kind of help you represent materials and architecture. This is a little house addition that we're working on right now in my office. And where the roof is, it is really the enclosed area that we're adding to our house. Um, it's a kind of typical house in Miami Beach, but we're also, like, the skin that comes off of it is kind of a, an interesting feature of it. So here you can see the addition. There's the house on the bottom. But we're actually, we're giving it this interesting um, treatment on the exterior. You can see it's got, like, a kind of, you know, fuzzy texture to it. And they're basically tiles that bulge out more or less. Um, and those are going to be clad. We're going to, we're going to extend the new elevation on the existing elevation. And it, it's going to do a few things. These are these tiles that bulge out more or less here of this texture. And those tiles are made of this material. And this is a material I've been researching um, for a little while at the university. Well, I can't really get this topic. But um, I also do material research and material studies. And this is like a new hybrid concrete that I've been working on with an industrial partner. And we're able to take, it's a wood-based concrete, we're basically taking invasive species trees out of the Everglades, which are our problem, and shipping them up and trying to do something beautiful with them. So in a way, this is like an insulating skin that we're going to put on the outside of this house, we're calling it you know, decorative tiling, but really it does perform in a certain way, and so we're looking forward to being able to measure what the continues required on the, on the part of the house that we're insulating with this. And then, you know, we represent this, but we also constructed these like scale mock-ups of the school. So these are some blocks that give an idea about that texture. And so we can, you know, vary the geometry of them so they bulge out more or less and they're curved. And then we can also vary the formula and get different textures just out of the material itself. A table that I learned um, recently um, for the Wilsonian Museum in Miami Beach, and it's currently in the lobby there, and it will be there until February, so if you have time, go check it out. But it was, it was a competition we won, and it was based on um, this chair, which is um, the number 14 chair by Michael Tonnet. It's spelled like it should be pronounced that name, but it's Michael Tonnet. And this is like, a, it's referred to as like a chair of chairs. It's a really great, I would call it minimal design, but it's noteworthy for a few reasons. Um, it's designed in 1859, and it's like a pretty simple <coughs> chair, um, but it's the first mass produced bandwood chair, the first piece of furniture to use wood bending on a mass scale. Um, and it's notable for that reason, but also for this reason. This is like 30 of those chairs fit into a one meter by one meter box. And it's the first flat pack chair, so the piece of furniture could be taken apart and stacked flat and shipped for economy and efficiency. And each piece could be individually <coughs> fabricated and then put together on the And this is to give you an idea about some of the wood bending walls that they use. These are like really heavy iron walls that they use to actually force the steam and wood into place. Um, and so, you know, we are interested in the manufacturing and fabrication of it. So this is the chair. Incidentally, the, the chair is constructed of six components and a bunch of screws. And so we constructed our table of six individual tables, which became one. 
and each table is also um, a sum of the six individual components. And this is it. So it isn't literally flexible, um, but it has the appearance as if it's like a malleable shape, but they all sort of um, stack up to become one larger collective chair. I can fit 20 a larger table. I can see 24 chairs from these units coming in collection. And so this is uh, a photo of it in the shop, like the minute we finished fabricating it, we were like, really excited about it. And this is in the lobby of the museum of the World Sandium. And the underside is really where all the design is. I mean, um, due to the organic nature of it, this is like a leg that fits into the frame underneath, and that thing is uh, cut and stacked up for rigidity. But you can see as a perimeter, the table kind of wanders away from the center. We, we came out unpredictable. Like the first one we built was like wildly unstable. Um, we kind of had to re re regroup and rethink it. So what we did was we put these sockets at every intersection. Because it was difficult to, to predict what would happen, we just allowed ourselves the option to add more legs where we needed. And this is the underside. You can see some empty sockets and some where these legs plug into it. And it's kind of an organic structural system in that way. This is it. It's 18 feet long by 60 wide. And here it is assembled with chairs. And you can also like take it apart into six individual tables. And you can also like rearrange it so there's a straight seam down the middle and an organic edge. So if they told me just like drop by and rearrange it, I won't make it for it. So feel free to do the same. It's like a, a big puzzle piece. And it's also good for big dinner parties. Mm -hmm. um, this um, this this is really the last project I'm going to show, but it also deals with this idea of a former colleague of mine, she looked at me called material misuse. So kind of looking at material for what it wasn't really intended to do. So this deals we did some experiments with plywood. Plywood is specifically engineered to like resist flexure. It's cross-laminated to make it rigid. Um, but we, we took it, and you know, the teams who make the film also did a lot of molded plywood studies um, that we were really interested in. We wanted to kind of get into that. So we started taking um, plywood and molding it until it would break. So these are molds where we reduce the radius. So we can put down here like we're, we're molding and molding, and then here it starts to break. Kind of located at the other point. Um, and here you can see a few profiles that we were able to form. And then we started thinking, like, you know, what if we start to squeeze and flex surfaces? How can we produce some feedback of patterns? Or as we squeeze it more, more light would come through, more transparency would happen. So, like, really thinking about material not from the perspective of what it looks like, but from like to an idea about the physics of the materials and as the object. And so we also made like a few curious um, mock-ups or case the structural studies. So this one is really, you know, like an unstable structure, like the frame wants to tip over, but because the skin is able to support itself. And the skin needs the frame, right? Like if the frame is in that shape, the skin won't pop out at the right angle. And if, if the skin if the uh, um, if the skin doesn't if the frame doesn't have the skin, it's not gonna stand up right. The skin and this is another one, and we just started putting these things together in different ways. This is one where the skin actually lifts the entire frame off the ground, um, rendering the structure, what's normally structure kind of kind of um, And this is like another large scale where we were making it bigger and bigger, and we have like an unusual shaped frame. Um, and we could, we could accommodate that and make it level by adjusting the pattern. And this was like an exhibition of plywood studies, kind of plywood studies of the title mock-ups, which was an idea about I'm trying to get something to do testing and first potentials. We took the lessons of those little studies, which are like curious case studies, and I had the opportunity to design a pavilion in Boston for MIT's 150th anniversary. And so we began with the model and systematically went about scaling it up. So it's worth noting we actually, um, Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, also has category three hurricane codes. So we had to get a permit for the structure. Um, so this is like a hurricane safe structure. Um, but these are the individual sections that we fabricated. And just to give you an idea, we'll stop. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this, just to give you an idea about the scale, right? We were doing this with our fingers and then at the scale took many people. And so we're really kind of zooming in a certain way by enlarging the artifact. And so we tested you know, different species of materials for what we can do. Some are very flexible and easy to take the shape, but um, and some are not. And the ones that were flexible might not be rigid enough to actually prop it up. So we tested many species of wood, eventually settling on, settling on wall converged, plywood quarter inch thick, 
And this was like a construction sequencing. We would just assemble these panels flat and tip them up. And so here's, here, here it is, after much work, um, one side, we were able to basically assemble this one side in just two days and tip it up and basically um, create this space. And this was like a kind of a curious case study. Um, and it was open to the public. You can see one wall lifts up off the ground and is supported by the powder. And the other one there's a kind of push. Um, and where it bends at the ground, you know, these kind of become like buttresses, these kind of act as columns. The other ones kind of act as like windows and, um, and screening. And these were actually our custom solutions of hurricane scrap. So we liked the dimensionality of the plywood, so we took quarter inch of steel, which was the same thickness, and we bent that, and handed it to the pavilion, and also to the slab. But we liked the consistency of the dimension. You can see here that they almost look like shoes. This was the kind of hurricane from one foot. And then these were also um, details that we put into the frame of the structure. Um, they're almost like little the size of fingers. They kind of stick out. And they allowed us to bend the wood over the frame and slip it up underneath and kind of hold it in place with a few set screws. You can see this. And then also, we, we embedded um, waterproof LED lighting in each panel so that at night it would take on, you know, it would look differently even still. And at night it was like really this luminous glowing object. Um, that you can see in the distance and approach. And this is basically um, the last slide. And I guess I would just conclude by saying, um, you know, my father was a tinkerer. Like, he would always take things that were broken and like take them apart and either fix them or, or not succeed in fixing them. But, um, you know, don't be limited by things that aren't broken. Like, you know, take things, break them, try to put them back together. Um, and, and also, I would say, I, I think creativity, it's important to surround yourself with creative people. So it's great to do these things and encourage them in each other. And, and I guess that's it.